Good afternoon and welcome to Fortress Press Live, where we connect you with the people and passions behind the books we publish here at Fortress Press. During the 2014 American Academy of Religion and Society of Biblical Literature Conference in San Diego, we brought together several of our Seminarium Elements authors to discuss their books. This is part one of our discussion and it features Brooke Lester discussing his book, Understanding Bible by Design, Create Courses with Purpose. Thanks to you all for being here. We all know how valuable conference time is. So making the decision to be here is, 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 is something that, I, I, on your part, is something I, I don't take lightly, and I know none of us do. What motivated me to write about course design is just my awareness. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not a young guy, but I'm a junior scholar, and I, I've been full-time for a very short time now after a pretty long slog through the adjunct years. So I, I find myself aware, and also I, besides teaching biblical studies, the administrative end of my job is as director of digital learning at Garrett Evangelical. What I find myself aware of are the ways in which pedagogy has, uh, the, the scholarship of teaching and learning has kind of come front and center. It's sort of coming into its own in higher education uh, across the board and, and, and in the uh, um, seminaries and religious departments, you know, religion departments sort of along the way, partly because, mainly because of online learning. Online, learn, online programs, hybrid programs, class, hybrid, online and hybrid classes. Those of us whose schools include online, hybrid, and, 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 and similar kinds of options, you know, we need to be able to justify to our accreditors that what we're doing is sound, that it's good learning, which means that first we have to convince ourselves. So we have to convince ourselves, we have to convince our accreditors, we have to convince prospective students that what we're doing is worthwhile. Um, I've noticed that learners are coming in with a high level of expectations and sophistication about not just about online and hybrid learning, but about learning generally. There was a time, you know, you could almost wish for these days, almost wish for these days to come back, where certainly at the graduate level, and I think probably also in the undergraduate level, you could get away with, you, 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 where as a faculty member, you're there because you're a content master. And the ability to transmit content from a standpoint of mastery is, is mainly what was important about you as an instructor. And, and learners were supposed to sort of, I'm not, it's simple to say, teach themselves, but handle the educational part of it amongst themselves or, or with whatever supports were, were offered by the institution. But the idea that we are, you know, there's always, you know, of course, there's always folks who are brilliant educators and, 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 and we've always cared about education, but we didn't learn any of it in our programs, uh, in our degree programs. I learned biblical studies. I did, a lot of student, I did a lot of teaching fellowships and a lot of student teaching, but I didn't have anything. I, I think all that we had in an organized way on education and pedagogy was a two-afternoon workshop. Um, uh, uh, in my upbringing. Aside from that, it was a bunch of us hanging around the PhD suite talking with one another. What happened to you in your class today? Oh my gosh, that happened? What'd you do about it? Oh, here's what I did about that when that happened to me and, you know, and so on. So pedagogy has come front and center and there's a lot of pressure to produce classes that are, that you can demonstrate as being pedagogically innovative, pedagogically sound, and not simply uh, top level in their content. And, um, and this question of translating classes into a variety of containers. If your school offers or is considering offering online classes, hybrid classes, and then what kind of hybrid? When are they coming? Are they, you know, how's that set up? Continuing edu- you know, you might have continuing. Ed- we have continuing education going on. So there's a question of how does my content, my subject matter, relate to our con- to the continuing education that we do? Certification programs, open courses. Um, not a lot of folks are doing MOOCs of different kinds yet, but some are. So what I find is that there's this incredible demand to be able to work fast and loose in a, in this way pedagogically, but very few, but not so many institutional rewards, right? Uh, Where, where's the rewards for the time? For one thing, you might be an adjunct. Uh, Chances are increasing that you are. And uh, so your time isn't being supported to try to be a better educator than the person next to you, but you sure better be a better educator than the, you know, that's at least one thing you want to be able to bring to your talk when you're, you know, is, is, is to offer that. If you're full time, you may be a part of an ever diminishing, fa- an, an, an ever shrinking faculty pool, you know, at one's institution. A lot of folks being retired aren't being, aren't being replaced. And so the sort of administrative work and the service work that everyone shares is, is always sort of going up. So it's this context of ever-increasing demands 
for being able to demonstrate good sound pedagogy and design courses that will fit in a variety of containers and relatively few rewards. And so the desire to be able to do that. How am I going to do this efficiently? And that's what led me to talk, as I do in my, uh, in my first chapter, about my own personal Groundhog Day, where for me, I was always revising my courses. There's always something wrong with my introduction to Old Testament course that needed to be fixed, and then I would fix it only to find the next year that it caused three more problems, which I then fix, you know, for the next year to find that those, you know, caused, caused three more problems. And then the, there's the conversation I'm having with a faculty colleague, usually an older and, you know, more senior and wiser faculty colleague, who kind of looks at me with pity because she doesn't revise her course at all. Um, you know, and, and as a consequence, she's publishing, right? As a consequence, you know, as a partial consequence, you know, she's, uh, uh, she's got a better looking tenure box. But she's also not happy with her course, because right? she knows what she wants to change. She just doesn't do it, right? Because so either way, we're both going through our own personal Groundhog Day. Me of everything changing, but with the same results year after year, and, and her without not changing things and always getting the same results. And so when I first became acquainted with understanding by design, this is what made me sort of grab onto it with both hands. Understanding by design is an approach to course design created by these two gentlemen, Grant Wiggins and Jay McTie, and they set it up in a, it's a three-stage approach to course design. And it sounds obvious when you say it, and they're not the first people to ever say, oh, start with your learning outcomes. And I, and I can remember being told this, you know, and I'd, I'd look at my, because I, I look at my existing syllabi, and they'll say, okay, we'll start with your outcomes. And I say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, if I'm going to redesign my course, I'm going to start with my outcomes. What are my outcomes? I want them to know the difference between 722 BCE and 586 BCE. Like, I want them to know the difference between Israel and Judah. I want them to know who, who Ahab is. I want them to, you know, and I kept thinking of content stuff. Um, and and uh, which I'm like, well, I'm already testing for that. So I would just beat my head against the wall on this business of, oh, just think of your outcomes and then design your course backward from your outcomes. And what I liked about, about Wiggins and McTie's approach is the way that they have me shaping my outcomes is to start with what I would call my highest aspirations, my most heartfelt aspirations for my learners. And what they call is enduring understandings. Right, so they ask, what are the enduring understandings you want your learners to go away with? So the way I think of that, this isn't them, but this is me, is let's say that you were to take my students who get A's and my students who eke by with a C plus, B minus, and test them on the content three months after they get out of my course. I haven't tried this, but other stu stu studies have been done by others along similar lines that strongly suggest they're going to perform very similarly to one another mm. if you just test them on the content. My A students aren't walking around three months from now with all the content at their fingertips in their head. So what's the difference between the two? The students who got A's are very often going to be the ones who are motivated to return to the material for some reason. That is, these are folks who were grabbed by something in the course and it was reflected while they were in the course that they were grabbed by it. That's what results in their high performance. And three months from now, they're going to say, oh, I think I'll preach on the Old Testament instead of preaching on the New Testament this week. Oh, I guess I better, I got, what was that thing that made me so excited in class that I can't really, so they go back to their textbook. They go back to the lectures. They go back to the materials. They Google some stuff. They're, they re-engage re -engage the material. The student who didn't have a great experience in the class doesn't do that. They preach on the New Testament. They do what, you know, they just don't go back to the Old Testament because it's a bad experience, or at least a lukewarm experience. So for me, the way I think of it is what Wiggins and Matai talk about as coverage versus uncoverage. That is, what's less important than covering certain expert level material is to facilitate my students having an experience of discovery, of uncovering things that excite them, uncovering something that makes them see the material through a different lens than they saw it before. So to that end, we're looking for, in terms of outcomes, we're looking for enduring understandings, what Wiggins and McTie call big ideas and essential questions. So for example, Something I find myself saying all the time is, oh, if the learners just, you know, were able to get that uh, different parts of the Old Testament make competing claims about God with one another, right? That, 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 that not all Old Testament texts are saying the same thing. If they get that, they're four-fifths of the way towards doing really well in my class. Um, to the extent that my students understand that the world 
in what Fretheim calls the world in the text, that is the biblical narrative, is not the same as the world or the history outside of the text, that is the history that gives rise to text. Once a learner who, who walks in not getting that, but once they get it, I think, oh, they're going to be fine. This is a person who's going to be fine, you know? Um, I don't normally think that about, oh, here, oh, oh, you understand the difference between Jehoiakim and Jehoiakim? Oh, you're going to be fine. Like I said, no, you know, you can, you can look that up later. Um, so Wiggins and McTie say, you know, you start with these big ideas that animate your whole course. Another one for me, since I'm just throwing them out there, is, uh, 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 and this comes from ideological criticism, texts do not only reflect the worldview in which they arise, but they seek, texts seek through their various devices to reproduce those worldviews in readers, you know? Once a learner twigs to that idea and starts getting excited about it, I think they're, they're, they're most of the way home, you know? So you start with these big ideas, and then Wiggins and Mattai ask, they go to stage two, and stage two is assessment, which feels so weird. It's like, okay, but what are they going to do? And like, we haven't yet decided what they're going to read and what their activities are going to be, but we're coming up with assessments. So how do we do that? Well, they ask, what performances would the learner need to do in order to demonstrate the enduring understandings that I'm going for, to demonstrate engagement with the big ideas that I feel animate my approach to the, to the course? And if it helps you think of what those performances might look like, they offer six facets of understanding that just start offering verbs. And I need some verbs, right? So like, for instance, what would a student need to be able to explain in order to demonstrate the enduring understandings that I'm talking about? What would they, how, what interpretation, how, you know, what kind of interpretive activity with a text would be necessary to show it? Application is another one, right? What would they need to apply? They'd have to apply either a method to a problem or apply something that they understand like myth in the Genesis stories to a different context like myth in the David Psalms applying something over here to something over here, if they can do that, what other perspectives on the content would they need to be able to show engagement with or understanding of to show that they've engaged these enduring understandings? So for instance, different students in the class or students who, who are approaching the material from another perspective. Um, so for instance, if uh, you know, well, one, one, a student from one background is going to be very excited and liberated by the idea that not every Old Testament text makes the same claims about God that every other Old Testament text makes. Other students are going to be coming from a place where that's, that's not such good news. You know, that's a little frightening, right? And so being able to see this from one another's perspectives. So these verbs like explain, interpret, apply, engage a perspective, show empathy. If they can show empathy for Ahab or Adonijah or, or some of the losers in the Bible um, for Jezebel, you know, uh, then, then I, uh, if, if they can begin and if they can show empathy for texts like, why would I care about the ritual of the put the fat of the fat tail on the fat of the shoulder and wave it? And why would I care about Leviticus, right? It's so common. And once they can show empathy, right, is one of the things, you know, if they can show the empathy to say, I can imagine what it would be like to care about that and what reasons someone had for caring so deeply about where you put the fat of the fat tail before you wave it and so on. So you notice we don't have activities yet. They don't, we don't have homework yet. Uh, they're not writing papers yet or doing presentations or anything, but I know that whatever papers, presentations, group discussions, whatever they do, these are the performances that are going to have to happen in those. Does that make sense? So, and, and how will I assess those? How will, what will serve, well, I like the way maybe Wiggins and talked about it, what would serve as compelling evidence? How would I convict a student of enduring understandings through the, in these performances? And that's it, that's your basic kit, is stage one is the enduring understanding, stage two is what performances would convict a learner of enduring understandings. And that's the field kit. That's what I think of as the field kit, the walking around kit. And now when I want to turn my course into an online course or a hybrid course, or I just want to revise it because I'm not happy with it anymore, um, then I'm going to decide on activity. All of a sudden, activities and resources don't really matter which ones they are. Oh, they can do presentations. That's fine. Oh, we don't, we don't really have a space to do presentations. All right, so they'll write a collaborative paper. Oh, we don't even know. It doesn't matter what the activities are going to be. 
oh, we can't get this textbook, we'll find another one. Oh, maybe they can find some readings online because uh, I can pick and choose among those very freely and, and, and revise them the way I want them to be because I know where this is going. I know what performances are going to be necessary to show the enduring understandings. I passed 15 minutes uh, and, I, and I want to be respectful of the other folks that are presenting. But this is, this is where, this is, this, that accounts for my excitement about it and hopefully with some of the examples I've given how I feel like in biblical studies. All of us content mastery dinosaurs who are trying to produce something pedagogically worthwhile for our students and haven't necessarily been prepared to do so, you know, in our formation. We need tools that are going to get us there as quickly as possible with as little investment of time as possible and where we can just be proud, proud of the, uh, of the results. And, and, and so an approach like this that, that, as I say, begins with these enduring understandings that I choose because they, they animate for me my, most, my highest aspirations for what my, how my learners can have a perspective-changing experience of the subject matter. Um, so yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks for your time. Thanks for listening to the discussion with Brooke Lester. To view the show notes for this episode or to leave a comment, head over to fplive.fortresspress.com forward slash 021. Fortress Press Live is available via iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher Radio, and YouTube. So be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform. Until next time, this is your host, Sean Tabbitt, signing off.